morning. I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior as we come to his throne this morning, for he is king now and forever, and we praise his name. Um, if you're joining with us today, maybe for the first time, or you've poked your head in before and you uh, just feel a little more comfortable here, we ask that you fill out one of these welcome home cards that are in front of, in every pew, and just drop it in the offering plate. That way we get to know you a bit better. We have several announcements for today. First of all, we are going to be celebrating, uh, observing the Lord's table. And if anybody's gluten-free, can they raise their hand just so that we make sure we serve you? And if not, that's okay. We just want to make sure, okay, uh, that we cover that. Um, after service today, uh, yes, there is a great event that we're kicking off. There's... Uh, just a great rivalry going on. We're asking that you ignore all of that uh, because we have, we have a new member class. Um, and then you can get to the Bills game after that. We have a new member class after the service today. It'll be uh, starting around noon once we get everybody down there. We're providing lunch. If you ha we know a bunch of people are coming already, but if you don't have that in your plans and yet you thought, well, I haven't joined the church or I'm interested in finding out more about what our denomination believes, or maybe just have, want to go through that refresher course again, we'll be meeting at noon at McKnight Parlor, and we are, we're going to have a good time there for the new member class. So even if you haven't signed up, you're very welcome to come and join us for that time. Rally Day for the kids is coming up this weekend. So it's at, we have three days of stuff going on. Friday night, any helpers, anybody wants to help on Saturday or help just on Friday night, we're asking you to come at 6 o'clock so that you can pray together, enjoy some fellowship together, and get the instructions for Saturday so we can hit the ground running. The rally day is going to be from 11 to 2 on Saturday. As for the kids of the community, we're inviting as many families in as possible. So if you know some families, some people that... You know, they're not tied into a church. They, they haven't been ministered to. Encourage them. Come to Rally Day. We're going to do a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to have a cupcake walk. We're going to have games. We're going to have prizes. We're going to have food. And then we can hopefully tell them a little bit about our Sunday school program, which then starts on the 19th. So if you want to help out with Rally Day, you want to help out with Sunday school, talk to Jan or Robin or sign up on the table back there. Or at the very minimum, and this is not a minimum thing, but pray for our ministries. Pray for Sunday school. Pray for all the ministries of the church. There are none that we hold in higher uh, esteem than others, but Sunday school is a big undertaking, so please pray for wisdom and strength and, and patience. Uh, above all else. I think that's all the announcements we have for today. Let's rise as we call to worship. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. Let us worship him. Good morning. Please join us with our first song, Be Thou My Vision.
Take in that last verse. His wounds have paid my ransom. We now confess our sins with each other. Pray with me. Dear Lord, forgive us for thinking of ourselves before others and before you. Give us a clear perspective that we may glorify you in all we think, say, and do. Take a moment. Silently confess your sins to your Lord. Hear the assurance of pardon from Isaiah 1. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Brothers and sisters, you are forgiven. Please have a seat. As some of you know, we here at Knox are very open to having testimonies and God sightings. And just if somebody has, the Holy Spirit lays something on your heart and you really want to share it from the pulpit, feel free to come up and approach me or an elder and we'll take that in and then hopefully get you up here. And this morning I had somebody who said, I just want to share something from the pulpit. And that is Casey. Casey, you want to come up? You have to run. This this is so long. It just will take forever. Here, I'm going to hold you up, okay? Oh. All right, speak into there and tell them what do you want to say about God. Guys, why does God do sing for us that we want him to do? Say that again. They didn't hear you. Say it one more time. Okay. Why does God do things we really don't want to bad do? Why? Because if we do it, then I think God will die if we kill him or something. We don't kill God. We save God. No, God saved us, right? Yeah. What did Jesus do for us? Um, he did a lot of sins. He died for our sins, he right? He died for our sins. And we are forgiven. We are forgiven. Right. You want to say anything else? Is that it? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Casey. Welcome. He just came up to me this morning and he said, he said, I really want to talk to the people about God. And it wasn't, it wasn't me trying to show off a cute kid. It was, God works in all our hearts from the smallest to the biggest. And I love it when people love God with all their sincerity. Let's pray today together. Dear Heavenly Father, you are just such a wonderful God. And when our minds and our hearts and our actions are driven toward you, Lord, we can find no greater purpose. There's no greater calling than that to be a son or daughter of the King, called to be an ambassador in this world, to speak the gospel to those who are lost, to love those who are hurting, and those who are neglected and shamed. Lord, to share our testimonies of being forgiven, of being saved, with those who desperately need to hear it. And Lord, knowing that at the end of this, at the end of this hardship that is life, this journey, this race, that Lord, we will find eternal rest in you. We will find that day of glory, that one day that never ends. That one day that we can adore you and you promise us nothing will take us away from your presence. That one day where we will be home and we will know it to the core of our being. This is where I belong. That one day where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more separation or sorrow. But Lord, we will find who we are in you to the fullest extent. And Lord, we look forward to that day, but until then, pick us up, Lord. Strengthen us. Forgive us when we stumble. Teach us to become more mature in you. Lord, today as, as the school year starts, we want to offer up a special prayer for the school season. For the students who go back to school or finding that transition difficult, especially amid still the pandemic and some of the restrictions going on. For the teachers that have to get back in that mode of, of sharing their knowledge 
Give them patience and wisdom. Help them to identify the needs of each of the kids and speak to them in the right way. We pray for the parents, some of them doing double duty as, as teachers and also as after-school tutors. Lord, help to, to brush off that knowledge that's very dusty in their brain. Help them to help their kids. Uh, help them, the ones that are struggling to get kids to school or get supplies. Lord, you know their needs. We ask that you speak into these situations. And Lord, above all these things, we also uh, offer up our Sunday school program. We ask for prayer for that as we try to fulfill the words of Scripture that tells us to bring kids up in the knowledge of the Lord. To share what we have known and what we have learned with the young so that they might grow up to know you and love you. So I pray for the Sunday school teachers and the helpers and the preparers that, Lord, you just so put excitement on their heart for a great season. Help them to be of one mind and purpose and body that they would work together as a wonderfully functioning team, uh, that you would bring, Lord, just open our doors to bring in all the kids that you want to hear the word and hear your scripture. I just pray that would be a great season. Keep these kids safe. Keep the teachers safe. Lord, all these things and so much more, we bring our hearts to you. We bring our struggles, our pain, our frustrations, our unanswered questions, our relationships, our finances, our jobs, our passions, our hobbies. We bring all of this and we lay it before you, Lord. May you do with it as you will. May you give us wisdom to seek you. In your name, amen. Well, long-time Knox people know that it's always a very exciting and also very rare day that we start a new book of the Bible. And we're going to start our journey through James today. So please open with me to James chapter 1, located on page 1172 in your pew Bibles in front of you. We're just going to be reading the first verse today. Please stand as we read God's holy word. From the book of James. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. May God bless this reading of his word. Please have a seat. Well, as we start our series on James today, I feel it's my duty to point out that not everybody is a fan of this book. Maybe you're not a fan. I don't know. One, one person, if you don't like James... You might be in the company of the esteemed reformer, Martin Luther. Martin Luther famously had a bit of a beef with the epistle of James. In fact, in one of his introductions to the New Testament, Martin Luther wrote that James was an epistle of straw. An epistle of straw. What he was talking about here is that out of all the building blocks of faith that were the Gospels and Paul's writings that were wood and stone that would build you up, James was just, his building material was straw. It was okay. It was fine, you know, but not as good as the others. Now, there was a few reasons why Luther had a problem with James. Uh, one of the reasons was that he was troubled by how few times that this one letter mentions the name Jesus Christ. Two times. Two times in this entire letter he mentions Jesus by name. He mentions Lord many times, but only twice by name. Uh, Luther said, well, you've got to have more than that. Luther was also a little concerned that there wasn't a heavy focus on the gospel thought every writing of the New Testament should be promoting the gospel. It should be heavily uh, marinated in the gospel. And, and Luther felt that James did not achieve that goal. And finally, Luther was more than a little disturbed from the perspective of a reformer that James might be used by weaker Christians to promote this philosophy of working your way to salvation, of what we call works righteousness. So, so Luther thought, well, if the people read James, they might come away with this impression that they can just work their way to heaven. 
and do enough good things. However, there are some people have known this, this conflict between Luther and James for a long time, and there's been a bit of a misconception. Uh, I've heard from some people that said, well, Luther wanted James cut out of the New Testament, or he, wanted, he hated the book of James. Both of those are not true. Uh, the canon was long since established by the time Martin Luther came to the stage. And in fact, later on in his life, Martin Luther actually came around on the book of James a little bit, begrudgingly. You know, one of those, ah, oh, fine, it's okay, it's God's word. You know, it's a, he gave it a grudging thumbs up. But I want to mention this because there are some concerns that people have about James, and we will be approaching those as we go through this series. We will be talking about what those accusations are, where, where these stumbling blocks are, and how the scriptures respond to these allegations. However, I, I want to say on the whole, when I talk to Christians about their favorite books of the Bible, James seems to come up an awful lot. People like James. I think one of the reasons is it's incredibly easy to read. It's very easy to read and understand. And for those of us uh, who don't like anything over a third or fourth grade reading level, James is right there, right? It's, it's very easy. Small words. Thank you, James. Small words. And it's popular also because it's everyday practical. Sometimes we're reading through Scripture and we go, okay, I'm having a hard time understanding this, and then how do I put that into practice? You never really have that problem with James. You understand what he's saying, and you understand how we should be putting that into practice. People really like that. They also like the fact that James is a fan of using very vivid images and illustrations that grab our attention, and then he kind of ties it into those commands and so that we kind of remember what those things are. Yet, going back to why some people might not like James, James does have the tendency to point his knobbly finger in your face and get right up in there and say, well, it's one thing if you say you believe in Jesus. It's another thing to live it. Do you live it? He's pretty strong about this. James took John 14, 15 to heart where Jesus Christ himself said, If you love me, what? Obey my commands. That had been the mission statement of James. If you love me, James, obey my command. And that becomes a major focus of his letter. The result for James is not an empty faith. It's not a hypocritical faith. But it's a faith that works. A faith that works. And that's the central theme that we'll find in this epistle. But before we get out into all of that, if you're wondering why we only did a verse today, it's because we need to look at who wrote this letter. Because by knowing who wrote it, we can learn about a lot about the focus of the letter and learn more from it as we go along. So what's interesting is that James was probably most likely written before 49 A.D. And that means that if that's true, and a lot of scholars believe that's true, then James is the oldest book of the New Testament. Did you know that? We don't, we don't order the books in the New Testament according to their age, but if that's true, James was first on the scene. His letter was first in the mailbox of a lot of churches there. That means James was written before Paul's works were written. That's why James never mentions any of Paul's writings. All the other New Testament authors tend to do that a lot that aren't Paul. They'll mention Paul's writings. James never does. In fact, we think that Paul was probably still Saul. He was still persecuting the Christians at the time of the writing of this letter. Now, verse 1 identifies the author here as James. And the question we have to ask is, which James? Because there are three. There are three James in the New Testament. So we have our, our three bachelors we bring on the stage here. We are candidates for authorship of James. Which one could it be? Well, our first candidate is James, one of the twelve apostles that you know well, who is the brother of John. He was part of the inner circle. Peter, uh, Peter, James, and John were always the ones that Jesus would take his side and do that special training and ministry with. However, that James could not have been the author. 
And we know that because James was the first martyr of the early church. He was killed very early on in the church's lifespan. He did not have time to write this letter and send it out. All right. Then there's another James. Another James who's part of the Twelve. And that's James, son of Alphaeus, or as we sometimes call him, and I don't think he appreciates this, but James the Lesser. Because there's James the Greater, right? And then there's James the Lesser, and we know almost nothing of this James. We know he was an apostle, and that's it. But because of such a, a, a quiet stature in canonical scripture, a very, I, I've never seen a, a scholar argue that this James could have written this book or he had any indication he would have written this. In fact, most scholars, the early church, believe that the James of this epistle was none other than the son of Mary and Joseph and the half-brother of Jesus Christ. That's the third James of the New Testament. Now, if you're coming from a Catholic tradition, it might surprise you to hear that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Catholics teach something called Immaculate Conception, that Mary remained a virgin for her whole life, that they had, I know you're scoffing a little bit, they had no, um, no other kids. That was just Jesus. But scriptures tell us otherwise. And in fact, of James and his family, we can actually trace James's life throughout all of scripture, throughout all the New Testament. We know a lot about him. So... We first see James mentioned in Matthew 13 and Mark 6, talking about the same account, when Jesus is starting his teaching in Nazareth. And the scriptures tell us that people were astounded. They were amazed at Jesus' teaching. Because they had grown up, they've seen this little kid grow up, and suddenly he was teaching them on a level they had never heard before. And scriptures say this, the people were milling around going, isn't, isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? So we see where James, that James is one of his brothers. That means James knew Jesus longer than almost everybody else, apart from Mary, in the early church. That if, if you wanted to know what Jesus was like as a kid, you go to James. And just contemplate that for a little bit. What would it be like bro growing up with Jesus as your brother? Well, I know every time somebody's hand got caught in a cookie jar, wasn't Jesus going to get blamed for that, right? There's probably, they're probably a little irked that this perfect kid grew up in their household who never fought with the brothers, who never twisted the ponytails of his sisters, who never disobeyed his parents, Probably a little bit of a resentment, a little bit of, you know, that kid's a little different than the rest of us. But just consider that James knew Jesus his whole life because that does play in to his letters. We know that like his family, J James initially did not follow and believe Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, we're told in John 7 that Jesus' brothers, including James, openly came up to Jesus and mocked him. He was in Galilee, and they said, Well, Jesus, we hear a lot of people down in Judea haven't heard of you yet. Why don't you go down there and do your miracles? Why don't you show them who you say you are? Get out of here, Jesus. And when Jesus' teachings got especially controversial, and he was in Capernaum, James and Mary and his whole family traveled to Capernaum to take charge of Jesus, to get him out of there, to basically to, to shuttle him away because they were embarrassed at what Jesus was saying and doing. He was bringing shame on the family. And James was part of that, that attempt to get Jesus out of there. In Matthew 12, we see Jesus' brothers yet again trying to disrupt Jesus' teaching trying to create a commotion. Get out of here. Just, Jesus, stop teaching. Come out and just be normal for once. Stop saying all this stuff. And then when Jesus was crucified on the cross, not one of his family members, except for his mother Mary, were at the foot of his cross, there with him as he died. And so we don't see from James that he had a faith in his brother before the crucifixion. But something happened. And I know what that something is. It was the resurrection. 
And when that happened, something stirred in James' heart that was faith. And suddenly, he became a believer in his brother as Lord and Savior. And we know this because Paul tells us in both 1 Chronicles 15 and Galatians 1 that after Jesus was resurrected, not only did James become a believer, but James was commissioned by Jesus Christ to become an apostle. Yes, there were more than 12. There were more than 12 apostles. But he wasn't one of the 12, but he was a part of this larger group that scriptures say Jesus commissioned to become apostles and go out. And he actually was joined, James was joined in that calling, apostolic calling, with his brother Judas, who, by the way, we think, wrote the book of Jude. So two brothers, half-brothers of Jesus, wrote two letters in the New Testament. So after this happened, after his commission as an apostle, and the ascension happened, James joined the other Christians to wait in Jerusalem, in the upper room, for the Holy Spirit to come upon them on the day of Pentecost. And when that happened, when he got that apostolic calling, when he got the Holy Spirit in his life, James was not content to be a back pew Christian. No offense to the back pew Christians. <laughs> My family's in the back. It's all right. It's all right. He wasn't content to like sit back, right, on Sunday and go, I'm just going to show up for church, but that's it. The book of Acts tells us James went all out. He actually became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He became a pastor of that church in Jerusalem. Peter was overseeing all the churches. James was overseeing the church in Jerusalem. And we, we actually see James, this James talk, especially when there's this council in Jerusalem. And they have to decide, do we let these non-Jewish Christians become part of the body of Christ? And James makes a ruling saying, yes, we absolutely do. And so we see him as a leader of that. J uh, Paul came to have great respect for this James. He called him in Galatians 2.9 an esteemed pillar. An esteemed pillar. I would love to get, wouldn't you love to get called an esteemed pillar by Paul? That is, that is high praise. And outside of the, the Bible, but early church testimonies tell us that James developed such a reputation of having such a solid faith, a faith that was lived out practically, that he earned the nickname James the Just. One story tells us that James would pray in the temple courtyard every day for so long for God's people that his knees became hard and misshapen like camels. That's all you're going to remember from today's sermon, that James had camel's knees. But that, that's a thing that went on. But just that he had that passion for prayer and passion to reach out and minister to the people of God. We should consider that from, from knowing everything that we know about James, that if there was anybody who could have called Jesus out and said, that's not really the Messiah. I knew that guy. I, I grew up with him. I know he's lying. He sinned. He never, he never rose from the grave. If there was anybody who could have testified to that, it would have been James. And yet we see a man who puts his life and his reputation on the line for his Lord and Savior. And he pours his teaching into those under his care. He's a great pastor. Now, I find it very notable that after all this we've learned about James, that when he starts his epistle here, he starts his letter, he does not identify himself in all these phrases we think he could have. He doesn't give us his resume. He doesn't say, from James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. I think a lot of us would be tempted to pull that card out if we were writing a letter. He doesn't even say, from James the Apostle, or from James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. What does he say there in verse 1? He calls himself the servant of God. Above being a pastor, above being the half-brother of Jesus, above all these things, the greatest calling in the mind of James was to be a servant of God. That's how he wanted people to know him. 
That's what he wanted to share. This humbly, humble uh, stance that James takes, starting off the gospel. He's not preaching high and holy at you. He's right there with you saying, I am but a servant sharing with you what God has taught me. We also know from this very first verse here who James was writing to. And he was writing to his former congregation members and other Jewish Christians who were now fleeing the very fierce persecution in, in Jerusalem that had arisen. This persecution against the church that had killed the apostle James, that sent Paul or Peter and, and others to prison. It was driving out all these Christians, so they fled. And they fled to other Roman cities where there were Jewish enclaves and Jewish communities. And they thought, well, we can at least find some of our Jewish brothers and sisters. And there they found that they were almost universally despised. And these Jewish Christians were not welcomed in by these communities. They said, well, you're those, those weird Christians. We don't want you to be part of us. And so they were abused and they were persecuted. And so James writes them this letter of hope, of instruction, and of encouragement. And beyond that immediate community to us as well. Now, James is a very odd letter. I want to point out a couple of things before we get into it. It's a, probably an odd man out in the New Testament. If you look at all 27 books of the New Testament, James sticks out like a sore thumb for a couple reasons. One is that this book alone in the New Testament is more like an Old Testament wisdom book than like a normal letter. It's more like Proverbs than Romans is what I'm saying. And I think that's one, one reason why some of us really take a shine to it. It's a really great desire in these few chapters that we read in James to seek out godly wisdom and put that wisdom into practice. And that was a hallmark of the wisdom books of the Old Testament. So we see that here. We see that many times James sets up a lot of parallels in his verses that we can actually go to the book of Proverbs and find very similar verses. But on top of that, we also know that James was in love with the Sermon on the Mount. You know the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 5, or 5 through 7, where he has this famous sermon. Well, James took that sermon to heart, and many parts of his letter here echo the Sermon on the Mount, allude to it. When he says, blessed are the, and you go, oh, well, that's a Sermon on the Mount reference right there. So James is very unique in how he pulls from the Sermon on the Mount. James also has a great mastery of the Greek language. And we can praise God. Why it's so readable for us is because he's so good with his words. He's so good even as it's been translated from Greek to English. Still, it's so vivid. It's still the flow of it. You can read through this whole book and it just goes down so quickly. And you're like, I understand what it says. And these images that pop out. He's so good at metaphor here. And he uses this. He uses metaphors and illustrations and rhetorical questions to poke you and prod you and get you to understand. He doesn't want passive listeners. He wants people who are engaged who are like, wow, like, really teach me. I want to know what's going on here. And finally, and a thing that makes James really stick out, is that for, for the 108 verses that are in this one letter, there are 59 commands. Nowhere else in the New Testament do we see such a concentration of commands for us to live our lives. And it's here, it's like, boom, 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 boom. And he's giving to one after the other. He's very interested in these, delivering to us these imperatives. And so it's, for us, it's impossible to read James. He makes it impossible for us to read this letter and think that faith is something that is either intellectual or emotional. It's just something you can understand and something you can feel, but you don't have to do anything about. James makes that impossible. That's why there's so many commands here. He's, you can almost see him rolling up his sleeves and beckoning you to join him in this work of faith 
And if you don't know how to do it, then don't worry, because James is going to give you step-by-step -step instructions. If you get those IKEA cabinets, you get those step-by-step -step instructions, you want them as clear as possible. And still, some of us build cabinets that are an abomination to everything. But for James, I think it's very clear what steps we need to take to grow in our faith and live it out. Now, I'm reminded of that story of the Scotsman who would sometimes row people across the river in his hometown when they wanted to get on the other side. And anybody who sat in this man's boat would invariably notice that on his two oars, one had the word faith carved into it, and the other had the word works carved into it. And so if you're in his boat, invariably you'd ask the question, what's that about? And in response, the Scotsman didn't say anything. He simply lifted up the works oar, and he kept rowing with the faith one for a while. And then he put down the works one, raised up the faith, and rowed with the works one for a bit. And both those times, the boat just spun in a little lazy circle. And then he dipped both paddles in, and he rowed hard, and he said, you have to have both faith and works. You have to be rowing with both of these if you want to make it to the heavenly shore, if you want to make it across our journey in life. As James takes us through this essay, we're going to see that he's very fascinated with examining the relationship between faith and works. How do these two relate? How do they play with each other, against each other, work with each other? How does that happen? How does that happen in a world that's broken? A world that's taken God's pattern, healthy pattern that He's designed for us in our life and that has corrupted it and torn it down because of sin. How can suddenly faith and works come into that to have any sort of effect? And in fact, James says it has great effect. It can make all the difference. It's a broken world, but Jesus can mend it by working through the church's faith and works. Now, only when Christ comes again will all be made fully whole. But that does not mean we should just sit and wait. He calls us to the Great Commission. And that first word of the Great Commission is go. Get off your seats. Go do things. Go put into action the good works I prepared for you. Each one of us has a different mission, but they are all the same in the end, which is to share the gospel and to love other people in the name of Christ. And so Jesus, or James makes this audacious claim that our faith through Jesus is greatly effective in our world. It is not a wasted effort. It is not something that is expended and ultimately has no consequence. That our lives live sincerely for God can make a real difference. Finally, I must offer a warning to you today. That as we go into these five chapters of James, I want to say this. This book will change you. It will change you. If you read this as a follower of Christ, you will be challenged to take actions you never thought of doing before in your life. It will challenge your status quo in your life, how you're living now. It will urge you and encourage you and poke and prod you into growth. It will change how you see other people. It will change how you treat other people. It will change you. This is living and active. And it has changed Christians in the past. And it will change you. So if that happens, don't come up to me in 10 weeks and say, you didn't warn me, Pastor Justin. That God has convicted my heart through these words of James. This book is really a boot camp for faith. We go into it in verse 1 and we're raw recruits. We don't know which way we should be marching. We don't know which way the gun shoots out. What bear? I don't know. But by the end of verse 20 of chapter 5, we are seasoned, hardened Christians marching for Him. Fully effective in our faith. James is how faith works how it works in your life, how it works to impact others' lives, and how it works to mold and craft you, craft me, 
and to a servant of Jesus Christ for His glory and His honor over all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's no small thing to open up a new book of Your Word and really start to study and understand it. Give us ears to hear, minds to understand, a heart to believe the words of James that we're about to receive. Help us not to just hear, but do what it says. To grow, to not be content with where we are in our lives, but to know that you always want more from us, Lord. You're always encouraging us to become more mature. And Lord, I pray that we would embrace the excitement of this journey, the excitement of knowing that we can become more mature through this book. Lord, I pray that your blessing would be upon our time together here at Knox. In your name, amen. As we call our ushers forward for today's tithes and offerings and we respond to the word, we remember the words of Matthew 6 that say, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where neither thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Not a penny that was ever given to God will be given in vain and will not be repaid to you tenfold, is what Jesus is saying. We come forward as we give. Give freely as you want. We also have a chest in the back, and we have online giving if you're more comfortable with that. and offerings. Use it for the work of your church in this world and bless those who have given. In your name, amen. As we come to the Lord's table today, hear now the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took the bread and he, after giving thanks to God, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. With thanksgiving, let us offer to God our grateful praise. With these words, Christ has commanded all believers to eat the broken bread, to drink this cup in true faith and confident hope that he will one day return in glory. In this supper, God declares to us that all of our sins have been fully forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he has accomplished on the cross once and for all. He also declares to us that the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, 
who with his true body is now in heaven and at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. So today, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may we not come to your table carelessly or with a cavalier spirit, but to understand what this means, the broken bread, your broken body on the cross, the cup, the blood that poured down. And Lord, these things for us, these things for those you loved, you have called to you, and you have given us through grace your forgiveness, eternal life. And so, Lord, we partake today with hearts of faith, hearts that know what you have given to us and know without a shadow of a doubt what you will one day do for us. Lord, we remember you until you come again. Please bless the cup. Please bless the bread. And all God's people said, Amen. This is his body, broken for you. this in remembrance of him. He took the cup, saying, this cup is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins.
Drink this in remembrance of me. And after they had observed the Lord's table, they left with songs of praise. Let's stand and sing our final hymn today. Sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Sing of your love forever. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I can sing of your love forever. Sing of your love forever. I could 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 sing of your love forever. Man. One day is a good start, but it'll take eternity to match how much praise we must give our King. Now receive the benediction. If you would like an uh, elder to pray over you after the service, we'll have one available in the front. We love to pray for the people. But now hear the, the words of 1 Timothy. To the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Go with God today. and the sea. Your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the 